guys wrote in your paper about the myth of reliable research. And, and that's another way that I think people are asked to squash their intuition when people say, well, the Dutch protocol is rock solid and there's all these papers about the validity of this treatment method or we know it's quote, life-saving care. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the paper that you guys co-wrote along with Genia, who isn't here with us today, but there were so many incredible points there that even after years of trying to understand this, a lot of things were highlighted that I didn't really know and didn't understand. And one of them is you guys talked about something called the innovative practice framework. And that shed a lot of light on what's going on for me. So can can either of you kind of explain what is innovative practice? And then that leads into runaway diffusion. Like these two concepts feel really important here. At the time that the Dutch were doing this innovative practice, that was a perfectly reasonable way to look for advances in medicine. This is before you could say the field of evidence-based medicine was developed. And so, you know, it's literally like, you know, what would be cool is, and then <laughs> you try it. And, and the numbers are small, right? So and like the these numbers innovative are small. practices are like on a small, small, small population where you're right. kind of like seeing if something might or might not work. People are operating off their intuition. They're like, I think that this would work. And then they do it. But, you know, then you run into the age old problem of redu reproducibility, right? There are like medicine and psychology is littered with all of these things that worked great for the one guy. But then when other people tried to do the same thing, it didn't work. Um, so yeah, the idea of the innovative medical practice. So what the, the, my, my, my read of that is that when they had their idea, like, let's give this a try, that was not a crazy thing. The crazy thing was afterwards when this really small innovative clinical practice yeah. was assumed to be evidence-based yeah. and then it, it, it escaped the laboratory and ended up all over the place. Well, in fairness, that's when it kind of gets mm. what feels quite murky and shoddy because it feels like the results came in enough for, for arguably the, the clinical trial to say, this isn't good enough. We tried now, you know, let, let's not continue. We might try again in the future, but right now this isn't appropriate. But that's not what happened. And even mm -hmm. further than that, when you look at the Tavistock, they did a clinical trial and they got results and didn't publish them. So then you're starting to go, now we're going actually into something that's purposeful as opposed to innovation that had some some worth to it, arguably. So the innovation in a scientific sense has to be followed by a much more critical methodology that tests the hypothesis that the, the innovative work uh, generated. And Polly Carmichael tried to repeat it and it failed to repeat it. And as you were saying, Sasha, there was a rapid diffusion throughout the world and, and the chain of trust, people just believed whatever the leaders taught them, and that this, mm -hmm. was, this was done science. And I'd love to know yeah. why. Why did that happen? Well, um, I'm speculating. I don't know why it happened, uh, except that uh, I, I think uh, doctors like to fix things. Doctors yeah. don't like problems that they can't fix. I mean, what does an eight-year-old and what does a 12-year-old know about the possibilities for living your life as a woman or a man? Um, and, and, you know, I hear all this all the time. I hear that the do uh, based on WPAS writings, uh, the doctor has to make an, a determination that the person is cognitively able to give informed consent, even though they mm -hmm. can legal informed consent. I mean... I've raised 12-year-olds and 13-year-olds and 14-year-olds. I love those little kids, but they needed a parent to tell them what reality was and what they could do and what they couldn't do. And the idea that I don't want to have children anyway, so uh, infertility is not an issue for me, and, I, and, and sex is not important. I'm not interested in sex. Uh, or today I'm, uh, I'm bisexual and tomorrow I'm eating disorder, and the next day, you know, I'm depressed and then I'm 
then I'm lesbian, and then a month later I'm trans. What does this have to do with our understanding of the normative process of being an adolescent? I mean, yeah, I like yeah. to go back to Eric Erickson, who never had the word trans in his vocabulary. And he said yeah. the task of the, one of the tasks of development yeah. was to stabilize your sexual identity. Now, he, yeah. meant, he meant orientation, but we, we have a larger concept of sexual identity. And so the yeah. idea that we have people with MD degrees and PhD degrees making assessments that a 12-year-old or an, a, sometimes a 10-year-old uh, or even a 17 or 18 year old is mature enough to make decisions about about changing their body. You know, I I can't get over that that there are doctors, including surgeons, who are willing to remove the breast tissue of, of teenage girls. I mean, it's my intuition is screaming. You see, what is wrong here? And I mean, a lot of the really get, bright kids get pulled me, into this. You, you were thinking about taking taking off my daughter's breast, who thought who thought today she was this and to, and yesterday she thought this was that. Man, you would have to get through me. I mean, you wouldn't yeah. get past me. Whoa. 